Right there, Vincenti, Garcia, Acosta as they hit the line. Oh, desperately close, desperately close. But there's no doubt Nardello's got it with the photo finish. You can see it there, and the Spanish rider is second, and Taffy gets third. And here comes the bunch coming into the line now, hot on the heels of the remnants up breakaway. Eric Zabel trying to finish it off now and get some more points. And on the line he does it, so Zabel still sprints well. Front there for De Klerk, we're now at 180 kilometres done. And the gap is opening and De Klerk uh, probably left to fry a bit too long there. This group will be too fresh for him, I think, as we now go to the next challenge. Quite a serious climb here, the Kleisberg. And this will be the hill number five on the course, so there's still 11 more after this. This is a really tough climb. It's a tarmac climb, as you can see. There's Lars Mikkelsen nearest to us there in the white jersey. It's actually called the Mont de l'Enclos in French. And this is the part of the course field that I feel is really the most strategic part, the beginning of the Tour of Flanders. Once they go over this, they drop down the other side. They've got the Cunotteberg coming after that, then almost immediately after that, the old Quarimont. And this is where the big pressure comes on in the main field behind. Obviously, at the moment, we've got this leading group of five riders who, for me, are five riders just hoping to survive and hoping that they'll get picked up by a leading group off the front of the main field. Currently being led by Frankie Andreu and Marty Jemison. That's good to see. And there in there as well is Ekimov and in fourth position, Georgie Hincapi. So he's announcing the colours early. They are putting the four US postal boys on the front here to drive this race along. It's good to see that Frankie is feeling good after his accident earlier this week and seems to have ridden himself back into some good form here. And he gives the team a lot of confidence when he can ride like this. And Jemison just behind him, the champion of the United States. He might well try and defend that title in Philadelphia in June this year. The gap, though, has flown up to three minutes now. And remember, the leaders are on the Kleisberg. The main field is approaching. This is a very hard part, and in fact, those leaders now down to four riders because we're hearing over race radio that in fact Eric de Klerk has been dropped by that group and he's caught somewhere in no man's land, soon to be picked up and left behind. You can also see the, the pink and blue jerseys of Lamprey. There's Evgeny Sprook there just in the picture. They're moving to the front now because they too realize they've got to move up their man, Franco Ballerini, who would certainly like to get a good placing in this bike race. He's the kind of bike rider who's always come up for the big occasions, always turns up for Paris-Roubaix or the Tour of Flanders. He's yet to win the Tour of Flanders, and that certainly would be a feather in his cap. But he is a superb classic rider. He's always there in the top six. He's so consistent. If you couldn't really follow a better man and be sure of a high finish, if you could stay with him, because he just seems to read classic races so much easier than most people. Nice shot of Marty here. Flying the flag at the front of the peloton of the Tour of Flanders today. Bit upset he never got a ride on the team in the Tour de France last year, but he hopes that the situation will change this year, of course, when the US Postal will go in with the defending champion Lance Armstrong. A lot of US Postal Service riders very much to the front there. Not only are they being led up the, the slopes here by Marty Jemison, there's a few more guys over to the left hand side. From George Hincapie looking pretty good. It looks as if Frankie Andre is slipping away a little bit from the, the leaders here, but Frankie did his job. I think he's pretty happy and surprised to still be in at this stage of the Tour of Flanders because he had a pretty nasty spill in the three days of La Pana there, bruising a couple of ribs and uh, having to spend one night in hospital at least. But I'm glad to say that he's uh, safe and he'll be good in form, in good form next week when we go through to Paris-Roubaix. This is the chaos at the back. <laughs> the bike race certainly going on at the front. And the gap there, 2 minutes 58. That's the official time gap. Now, it's not a big gap yet, of course, and those riders up front are Art Vierhouten, Lars Mikkelsen, and Jean Mario Otenzi, and Jesper Skibby. We believe that the clerk has been dispatched, and we'll try and pick him up with our cameras as we move towards him, I would think, as the main field now. Well, I suppose, really, the big danger man up there, because of his solidarity, will be Mikkelsen if he stays away. Absolutely, but there's still going to be a big acceleration over the next few kilometres as we go over the top of the Klausberg. They go down the other side now and then the riders looks like there's a problem at the back. In fact, that is Marty Jemison and the other rider is Dylan Casey. So it's a swap of wheels here. I think it must have been Jemison who punctured and Dylan Casey, the younger rider, has given him his wheel to get him back in the race very quickly. So a good move there by the two boys. No team cars around to help out at that moment, so it should be okay for at least Marty. Not too sure whether Dylan will get back. 
Well, the problem with the Tour of Flanders is sometimes you've got to wait for two or three minutes because these roads are so narrow. And if a couple of bike riders have been dropped on one of the earlier climbs, the cars can be blocked. Bounders, I felt they'd done absolutely too much work. They tried to take control of the race and uh, maybe just boosted by that victory midweek at Gernvevel game that they've decided still to come to the front. But in a race like Paris-Roubaix, you really need to conserve your energy a little bit because the important thing is to have more riders at the finish as possible. Well, somebody's instructed Farm Fries to put the hammer down. We're absolutely flying here at the moment. Uh, the road has come off the cobbled sector, but just look at this now. This is the chase in full flight. Now, we're still a little way, but not that far from entry into the forest of Arenberg. Jackie Duron here, as we rejoin the leaders, is applying the pressure. Uh, we're at Kerenang now, a 1,600-metre stretch, of Category 2 cobblestones. They're all going to follow the wise old Jackie Duron as he tries to pick the smoothest route. Uh, but this race is now very much under pressure. Tom Steele's in second place, giving a good length to Jackie while he sees the cobblestones for himself. See how Jackie Duron was just riding down the outside of the road there. Now this is a very dangerous thing to do, especially on dry Paris Roubaix, because you're actually riding through a lot of small stones, little flints that have been brought in during the last few months while it's been raining, and that is when you do seriously get a bad risk of a puncture. But no problem there for Tom Steeles. He allowed Jackie Duron to, uh, to ride, you know, two or three bike lengths in front of him. And then once we get onto the, the smooth asphalt, he's in fact just moved up. Harry Bay for him, as we heard David Miller said, is one of the most important days of the whole season. Well, we're looking here at the names of that leading group. They're still up here. They've thinned down, as I say, from an original group of 12, which got away before the first sector of Pavé at Troisville. And they're holding on at the moment, Paul. The last time check I had was 3 minutes 20 seconds. It's certainly, and uh, Andre Schmiel is still, still right. There's a problem. This is Jackie Durand here. I would think Jackie Durand's got a flat tyre. Ah. Oh, that's unlucky. This is a bad section to have a flat tyre, Phil, because on the, the asphalt sections, it's so difficult to actually organise yourselves and get in car. They actually had to put a special bike on the roof just for Kelly. Absolutely. He was, certainly was one of the last bike riders to actually switch across to the clipless pedals, and uh, he really was a, a real traditionalist, Kelly. He didn't like too many things being done to his machine. He liked to mm. stick to the bike that he had. In fact, until the very last year that he raced, he was still one of the few riders that used to use cotton handlebar tape. <laughs> that sounds like Sean to me. And remember that Sean Kelly was the big winner of this race. Uh, he, he won it when they increased the prize money to many thousands of dollars. And you can bet your life Kelly was the first in 1984. And then he won again in 1986. He loved this race. Well, right on the back here is one of the, the new teams we've seen on the circuit this year. This is the Bonjour team from France, and the man wearing 214 there is Sebastien Joly. The team, in fact, is looked after by Jean-René Bernardeau, who's a former uh, wearer of the yellow jersey at the Tour de France, a former white jersey winner outright at the end of the Tour de France. Yeah. And he's actually brought this team along slowly over the last few years because he's actually been looking after the Vendée U amateur team in uh, the Vendée region of France, which is over by Brittany. And he's been dreaming of bringing a young team up to the level of being able to be professional. And this is their first season. So, bonjour for Jolie. Perhaps Bonnui might be a better name for the team right now because I think he's losing contact with that league group. And it's the Rabobank now. The experienced squad with uh, Sorensen trying to drive on this group now. Remember, by the way, that uh, we saw Rolf at the top of our show there. No Dane has ever won this race. Only nine different nationalities, by the way, have ever won Paris-Roubaix uh, since it was first created and won by a German uh, way back in 1890. To get back up to this leading group, which is now down to six men. It's Marty Jemison uh, just ahead here of Matty White. There he is, could be in the spot of bother as well. But Jackie Duron, you know, Paul, chasing back there. He's achieved an awful lot in his career, and he seems to have gone largely unnoticed. I mean, back in 92, that long escape, which gave him the Tour de Flanders, and then two years ago, he won Paris Tours, and that was the first French victory for, what, 42 years? And he also won the prologue. OK, a little bit of luck at Saint-Brieuc, which gave him the yellow jersey in the Tour de France, but he's won other stages in the Tour. He's done an awful lot, hasn't he? Absolutely, let's not forget he's been two times national champion of France as well. Yeah. A chance there just to see the national champion's jersey of Jan Kersi, on the front there for the three he received in the Tour of Germany last year. He's tried to come back and in fact he snipped a win right out in February but uh, basically now he's trying to recover and do some uh, personalised training to get back perhaps for the Tour de France. Look at the speed here though Phil, this is unbelievable. Is. I remember I always used to love Paris-Roubaix and I always used to get very psyched up for the event 
And the one year I actually was injured and wasn't able to take part in the race and I decided, well, I'd bite the bullet and I'd actually go and see the bike race. And I was astounded standing at the side of the road at the speed because actually in the race as a bike rider, you don't really feel as if you're going very fast. But here, you can just get an idea of what kind of speeds these guys are doing over the cobblestones. Yeah, they're bouncing the way at a tremendous pace here. And one wonders sometimes how these bicycles do hold themselves together. And again, we join the tail end of the line as we look at... Uh, it is a psychological point of the race, and they like to make sure they've got the race under control if they have ambition of winning. It looks as though Tom Steeles has caused a little split there. Up comes Dmitry Konyshev, joins them nicely, no problems. Marty's recovered from those cobblestones as well. He's going well. So too is Matt White. This guy, Paul, is such an enthusiast. He's got 120 kilometres still to ride. He's licking his lips. He just loves every minute of it, doesn't he? And good old Jolly is back as well. Absolutely. I think we just caught a glimpse there of uh, Jackie Durand being pulled in by the main field, so that was unfortunate for him. He was mm. in an ID being pulled in by the main field so that was unfortunate for him he was in an ideal situation in that lead reach because they seem to once rabbos have come off the front the farm freaks have gone up to the front to say anything you can do we can do as well well there's Johan Museo there wearing number three number one is the honor of Andrea Taffy as last year's winner Museo I don't think has actually shaved all week since the <laughs> Tour of Flanders it's actually an old wives tale that a lot of bike riders still stick to you know that you don't want to shave the last couple of days before a big event because the old uh, story is that if you do shave it takes just a little bit away of uh, a little bit of energy away from your you and that's why you see a lot of riders the, the morning of a big race not having shaved so that's Paul Sherwin's excuse. Anyway, as we now look at this little breakaway, driving on towards the Forest of Orenburg, that's the next stop. Robbie Hunter, far left of our picture. We've had quite a nice week, actually, because Robbie Hunter and his team have been staying in our hotel. We've been having our usual springtime jaunt with a small group of Americans, and we've had lots of time to have conversation with Robbie. Anyway, as we look at the riders now, steadily making their way towards the Forest of Orenburg, one man who will no doubt be there is Graham Watson, the great photographer and a good friend of he certainly knows all about the Forest of Arenberg, and I agree with him. This is the most important strategic point of the race to me. It's not exactly where you're going to win Paris-Roubaix, but so many bike riders in the past have actually lost it here. We're in the Forest of Arenberg, 2.4 kilometers. We have a leading group still of six bike riders. Jackie Durand has been blown away, and now we can see right on the front a good lead out here, in fact, by the little rider from the Bonjour team. This is Sebastian Jolly setting the pace, and Marty Jemison jumping across to the side there to try and get a slightly smoother ride. Well, a massive crowd indeed, very orderly now because they put the barriers up the day before the race to keep them off the cobblestones. The last time check we got before entry into the cobblestones showed Laurent Debian three minutes behind and the main field pull at four minutes and ten seconds. So it's quite a nice gap at the moment and Tom Steeles has been in this situation before and he didn't get brought back. Absolutely, he ended up finishing in third place, a great ride by him. But you know, I think we will see that gap of four minutes come down pretty rapidly because the main field, when they approach this point of the course here at Arenberg, they will pick up very quickly. We've already seen that the Farm Fritz team are looking forward to moving their man Peter van Pietigum close to the front. But also, Johan Museo and Andre Schmiel will be looking at this, this place here to, to move forward and try and split the race up a little bit. Approximately halfway down this sector of cobblestone, Sebastian Jolie has uh, tailed off the back here, leaving just five riders up at the front now. Still Matt White there, second from the end. Marty Jemison hanging on as well as Tom Steeles drives this race now. Right up in amongst the cars is Jolie now. They've gone round him. He looked as though he was suffering when he came into the pave here at the forest. And now Tom Steele's doing all of the work. You can just see Jolly there onto the left of our picture and he's having a much worse time of it here as he bounces over the cobbles. Actually, Marty Jemison's having a pretty hard time mm. as well. He's not quite on the back wheel there. Matt White with the yellow helmet there is just hanging on into fourth position and Tom Steele's has decided, right, if there's anybody weak in this breakaway now, I'm going to get rid of them. Completely dedicated, completely concentrated. He's not a time trialist, but for the moment, he's riding at his own pace, setting his own effort. Marty is in trouble now, latest from the field is the bunch is now at three minutes so they've knocked a minute and ten seconds off as they approach the entry into the forest of Arleberg and here they are, so I think they might be even closer than that now. Well I knew they would accelerate over the last couple of kilometres, this is the chicane that's been constructed by the Society Tour de France to slow down the riders as we come in there. Right on the front there we've got Museo there in about fourth or fifth position on the wheel of Peter van Pietigum. All of the big stars moving to the front here. 
there's Frankie Hoy on the right-hand side. Yeah. And that looks very much like Daniele Nardello, the rider for the oh. Mape in first position. Yes, one or two riders had a rough ride there and got bumped out of it. If you notice, the Lamprey boy is in trouble. Stuart O'Grady comes through. He's back in the field then because he had a puncture earlier on. As they now, it's every man for himself. Georgie Hincap, he's just passed through. He's got a good position at the front of the peloton. So he's got, he's motivated and he's not making any mistakes yet. And it could be every reason to think the winner will come from this group. Salvatore Camesso is the champion of Italy with the green top to his jersey. Hoy's got the lead now at the front. Well, Frankie Hoy having a good season already so far. You know, a lot of pink and white jerseys at the front too of the telecom team. They are looking to try and keep themselves high in numbers at the front of this bike race as we return to the leading group, which is now down to three riders because Matty White is just getting tailed off the back, but Matty's going to dig deep. He's a courageous bike rider. He knows that this is a good situation to be in. He wants to try and keep himself in the front of the bike race for as long as possible. And Tom Steeles has not asked anybody for an ounce of help, and he's just put the hammer down and he's reduced this leading group now from what originally started off at 12 after 37 kilometers of bike racing down to three well he's got rid of the boys i'm not sure he's going to profit by that move as we come out of the cobblestones across the railroad crossing three riders there matt white just hanging on by his braces and i think the other two have gone off the back as we go back to the main field now they are driving on george hincap he's got himself right to the front He's the team leader for the day and he's now seeing his way clearly as Museo is sitting just behind him. And Museo knows all about George Hincapi. Taffy is off to the right of our picture. So the men that know just how important a good ride down the forest is are right there on the front. And look at the chaos that this bike race causes here. This is what it's like if you're at the, the rear of the main field.